some instances, there are significant changes that are being uh, built into the code. Some of those advantageous changes, some of them you better be careful about what's looming on the horizon. So, you know, January 1st, 2024, uh, the SECURE Act uh, 2.0, more of that uh, came into play. And one of the things that uh, we're going to start to see this year now will be a, a variety of things. So, for example, anybody who has an employer plan, employer-sponsored retirement plan like a 401k, uh, your employer now can elect, it's not a requirement, and I'll, I'll make a, come back to a, a comment about that here in a second. But they can elect to allow the employee to have the employer match be deposited onto the Roth side, okay? So if you think about it, for those 401K plans that have adopted Roth opportunities inside of the plan as opposed to the traditional pre-tax method of funding those accounts, Employees have had the opportunity for several years now to make Roth deposits, provided the plan allows it. Now you can direct the employer match to go onto the Roth side as well, whereas up until January 1st of this year, the employer match had to go and had to be deposited onto the traditional side. Now, the downside that goes with that is if you elect to do that, you're going to get a what looks like you got a pay raise because your W-2 at the end of the year is actually going to get bumped because the employer match is now going to be considered taxable income to the employee, okay? Whereas before, because the employer is still uh, taking that deposit as a tax deduction, before it was going in pre-tax, it was no big deal. Well, now all of a sudden the IRS says, well, wait a minute, we now need to collect, you know, the revenue that's due off of that money because it's not going in on a, uh, on a pre-tax basis. So that was, that was one change. Uh, another couple of things that came into play, you now can, if you're self-employed and you have like a SEP or a simple uh, retirement plan that you've established, you can now uh, establish SEP and simple Roth IRA accounts. So that is something that is different. Those obviously allow for higher contribution limits than what uh, traditional uh, IRAs or uh, contributory Roth IRA accounts would normally allow because now your deposits are going to be tied to uh, business profitability and business success. One of the other changes, uh, and this is a big one that we, we talk about all the time with our clientele in the office, that SECURE Act is, has introduced is um, uh, the required minimum distribution age for traditional uh, retirement plans. So 401Ks, 457s, 403Bs, traditional IRAs, et cetera, there's about 20 different kinds of things inside that, uh, that traditional um, sense of retirement accounts. Those now have a provision where uh, – so if you go back a few years ago, uh, originally uh, age, the age of 70 and one-half was the required uh, starting date for required minimum distributions. And then that went from 70 and a half to 72. It has now gone – Secure Act 2.0 has taken it from 72 to 73 – and if you're not the age of 63 by 2033, which this actually does include me, my required beginning date now is not until the age of 75. So if you think about it, you know, we've got this uh, evolving uh, distribution uh, mandatory start date that continues to change on us. Now, and then here's what's interesting, because and this is where a lot of people will um, – kind of slip into maybe a, a little bit of a trap, and you have to be careful about this, because what people then don't understand is that, well, wait a minute, though. You can, you can start pulling money out of a retirement account, an IRA, uh, et cetera, anytime once you're, you're you know, after 59 and a half. That's when the tax penalties go away. The however, though, is still the age of 70 and a half is still a viable age in the tax code because that's the age in which an individual – uh, can now take money out of their traditional IRA, and they can do what are referred to as qualified charitable distributions. And Phil has maybe talked about that in the past, where anybody who's supporting a 501c3 organization, they can take money out of their uh, IRA account once they're the age of 70 years and six months or older. Don't do it at any point under that because it will become a taxable withdrawal to you. But once you're 70 and a half and beyond, you can have your IRA custodian uh, distribute money directly to your uh, your favorite charity, a qualifying 501c3 organization, 
That distribution is a non-taxed event to the taxpayer. Of course, a charity is a non-taxed event anyway. It's a great deal uh, in terms of how to support organizations that you might already be supporting anyway. So we tell people, look, don't, you know, just because you've heard, well, now my distribution age is at 72 or 73 or 75, that still doesn't mean there aren't other opportunities built into the tax code that you actually can take advantage of. John Everson from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue, our guest here uh, this morning on the program, Bill Stubblefield. Uh, good morning, John. Uh, when I was much younger, the financial investment was a lot simpler. So I get very confused <laughs> now with the tax code and how you need to respond to it. Uh, going quickly to the IRA and the uh, charitable distribution, is there a limit yeah. that you can pull out each year for charitable oh, contributions? Yeah, a- a- excellent question. Uh, yeah, in fact, there is. So, uh, in fact, I want to go back to your, your, your comment to set up your question. I, I will soon, here in another about 60 days, I will finish – my 38th year in this business. There is no question at all the complexity of the rules and all of the, uh, as I like to refer to them, the trap doors and the trip wires is way more complex today than it was when I first got into the business many decades ago. But what's interesting about it is that up until uh, uh, December 31st of this year, a person could do a qualified charitable distribution from their IRA to their favorite 501c3 organization. The limit was at $100,000 per year. Now, that number did index uh, effective January 1st, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and I may have to look this one up for you, but I believe it went to 125000 this year is the, uh, the maximum amount that you can do as a um, qualified charitable distribution. Uh, for this year going forward. And then what they're talking about is then indexing that uh, that contribution maximum as we start working our way through time. John, uh, for the 120, 125,000, over how many years can you carry over your, uh, your charitable contribution? In other words, if you have an X amount in year one and you only use Y amount for the first two or three years distribution following that, okay. h- how long yeah. will that that allow you to do it yeah great great question so and now and then you got to be real careful because i'll go back to your comment about how confusing the tax code is because you just took two pieces of the tax code and blended it together into one question okay so the way you you phrase the question it refers to uh, uh an individual who is still uh, uh itemized uh doing itemized deduction schedule a as part of their 1040 okay my understanding is if you've got excess contributions uh, to, to charitable causes that you are itemized deducting that you can carry, and there, there is a limitation that the IRS allows you to use on a year-by-year basis, you can carry those forward from what I understand. I think it's on an unlimited basis carrying those charitable contributions going forward. Here's the however to that. Remember this. If you're doing a qualified charitable distribution directly from your IRA, so you're doing a QCD from your IRA to that favorite charity, that is, that contribution is not going to show up on Schedule A as an itemized uh, deduction or something that would be uh, deductible because the, the withdrawal from the IRA is not taxed income in the first place. Okay, So as we tell people, you're better off not to recognize the income and have it go directly to the charity free of taxation versus recognizing the income and then turning around and taking, trying to take a deduction, which may or may not get limited in terms of how much you could deduct in a given year. Hey, John, this is John Gilstrap. Um, if, if I start taking my Social Security at age 62, which is the, when, it, when it's first allowed, 62 and change, whatever that is, um, I can do that, but it's at a fraction of what I would get if I wait till I'm 65 and yes, 65 correct. and a half, whatever the, those weird numbers are. Now, if I start taking at, at the full amount when I can first do that, that is a fraction of what I can get when I get to 70 or 70 and a half. And that's a true statement as well. Yes. It, is there an analogy to that in the withdrawal from... 401k plans. I can start when I'm 59 and a half, but assuming 
all else is equal with, with the family's finances. Is there an advantage to waiting until seven to the required distribution? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and, and the best way that I can answer that one is that question is best answered quite literally on a case-by-case basis. And, and here's, here's the point that I make. We see a lot of people, we, we meet a lot of people these days. And, and again, understand there's a spectrum of folks that we work with. So some folks whose income and resources are uh, somewhat limited. So they have to be very careful about how they allocate resources and what they use uh, money for and the, 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 the speed and the pace with which they would be doing uh, drawdowns and withdrawals, okay? So as to uh, assure that their, their funds are gonna last their lifetime. The other end of the spectrum, we see people who have uh, been very successful at deferring. Uh, I, I, the term I like to use is they've stuffed their 401k uh, or their retirement accounts full of pre-tax cash. That actually creates a problem at the other end, which is if, You've accumulated these, these large sums of money. Got to remember, once you get into required minimum distributions, you now are subject to the Internal Revenue Code's uh, formula for how much taxable income you're going to recognize beginning at your required beginning date going forward for the remainder of your lifetime. Okay? And one of the, a, a term that I coined a couple years ago, many years ago, maybe, maybe I read this somewhere, I don't know but I, I use a lot, is we actually do experience a lot of people who uh, work with a lot of people who experience bracket creep. In other words, as they get to certain ages where they have to start doing those required minimum distributions from those, um, those retirement plans, a tax bracket that they had, had been in that maybe was very, fairly modest and was comfortable for them and so forth, because of these large distributions of taxable distributions, they now have to recognize they wind up in higher tax brackets, and you got to remember, distributions out of IRAs, 401ks, all these uh, these pre-tax uh, retirement plans. Those distributions really only rise over time because what's happening on an annual basis, you're taking the prior year-end account balance and you're dividing that by your remaining life expectancy factor from the IRS tables. And so, as you get older, the divisor continues to shrink. It gets smaller year by year, which even if your, your, your retirement account just produced a 0% return, even if it was flat, annually, you're always going to be taking larger distributions. Well, normally what we see is people do make some money on invested money divided by a shrinking divisor, which creates year by year these distributions that continue to rise over time. And then I want to tie this back in because this ties back to Secure Act 1.0. Uh, back in uh, that became law back in January of 2020, which said that uh, it used to be if you were leaving uh, those retirement accounts to a non-spousal beneficiary, so children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, uh, a, a person, someone other than, than charity, okay, that uh, it used to be that those non-spousal beneficiaries had their remaining life expectancy to do those distributions of your deferred retirement accounts. That time window now is 10 years. So for a lot of people who've accumulated a, a fair amount of, of pre-tax dollars inside of these retirement accounts, you know, if they're not paying close attention to what's going to happen when they get to the end of their life, they may be trying to, to, to take a, a, a large sum of money. And as I like to refer to it, they're trying to jam it into a funnel where the mouth of the funnel is only 10 years wide. That in turn creates a lot of taxation. So as I like to refer to it, it's a boondoggle for the IRS because it, it ultimately many times winds up creating higher levels of taxation than if a person had paid attention and say beginning at the age of 65 or 67 or whatever age started doing either drawdowns from their, uh, those retirement accounts or even looking at doing Roth conversions and going ahead and paying some of the tax on that money instead of deferring it all to the uh, to these large lump sums when they pass. Does that make sense? Um, yes, it does. Sounds like you're saying start earlier. Yeah. I mean, start earlier. Yeah, and pay, pay attention. Pay close attention to what's going on. Yes. Well, it's also interesting. <clears throat> my, my mom predeceased my dad by quite a number of years. And when my father yep. passed away, my brother and I started receiving 
kind of out of nowhere, started receiving his required distributions. Yes. What if he had if if he had passed? He died when he was eighty. But if if he had passed when he was say I don't know below the the age of of mandatory distribution. Upon upon someone's death, does the mandatory distribution start right away to the heirs, or does it wait until he would have been? You know, great, yeah, great question. No, it it starts right away. So so think about this. So let me let me ask you a question real quick. Did your father pass before December thirty first, two thousand nineteen, or he, after that date? Before. Before. You still there, John? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so he, he passed before. Okay. Yes. So think about this. So it, that ties back to what I said there a minute ago. You and your brother would have your respective lifetimes to do those distributions. Had your father, let's say, passed away uh, January 1st, New Year's Day, 2020, and any point from that date going forward to where we are today, your distributions would have only uh, – would have had to have been completed – within a 10 year window of time, okay? And that's where a lot of people, there, there's a lot of confusion about that. And there are a couple of exceptions to that scenario. So in other words, if you had say a minor beneficiary, they don't have to start uh, immediately, but the 10 years does start running when they hit the, you know, uh, adulthood, okay? So there, there are a couple of, of, of provisions, there are a couple of wrinkles that you can uh, uh, take try to take advantage of. But ultimately, it comes down to, as we tell people all the time, you just have to understand what you're dealing with. As I like to refer to it, you know, uh, owning these retirement accounts, 401ks, IRAs, et cetera, is much like owning a case of dynamite. Dynamite's a useful tool in the hands of a qualified explosives expert. But if you don't understand what you're doing and you're handling dynamite, that could be a problematic. And so we see people from time to time making decisions without really fully understanding uh, all of the if, ands, and buts that sometimes come into a decision that on the surface seems to be fairly simple and easy when, in fact, there may be way more to it. You know, it's, it's a little bit like an iceberg. You know, what's below the – below the what you can see may be bigger than, than what you can actually uh, spot, you know. Don't, just, don't you know, mention icebergs to Bill. It brings back bad <laughs> memories, John. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, hey, John, <laughs> let me shift to a mechanical question, mechanical aspect. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the IRA uh, rules and regulations. Uh, who promulgates the tax code? Is that a congressional uh, function, or is that something that's been delegated to the IRS? That's a great question. So it is. It's supposed to be at the congressional level, okay, but the Treasury Department, in fact, uh, and I guess the IRS is a subset of the Treasury Department, uh, then will provide guidance in terms of how, how their interpretation of what Congress intended happens to be. Okay, So there, there are times where it's like, well, wait a minute, but that's not what the rules actually say. And, but then Treasury will say, well, no, this is our interpretation of that. So most of the stuff is, you know, they're, they're embedded into these bills that – you know, or, you know, several reams of paper uh, thick that people are supposed to read within, you know, 24 hours and then go vote on it, which sometimes is why we see things being designed and built and put into uh, play that may not make a lot of sense in terms of uh, Main Street USA practicality. John, how do folks reach you for more information about the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors? Yep, we are uh, located at 1270 Winchester Avenue here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, or you can reach us by phone at area code 304-263-4343. And remember, the Marius Group has offices uh, in four other cities in the state of Virginia. So we are, uh, we're well represented in the Mid-Atlantic area. John, good stuff. You always do a great job, man. Very good. Gentlemen, you have a good day. You Thanks, too. John. Take care.